Amen. You may be seated. As we get into the message today, you might think Easter is coming next week. Uh, This is more of a Palm Sunday message, but uh, I follow the will of the Holy Spirit, not the liturgical calendar. So... (laughs) But today, as we get into part two of our King of Glory, uh, this is a continuation. Remember where we last left, uh, with last week being the glory is gone. God God left, God's glory went up, left Jerusalem, and left Israel. And that's where we get that word Ichabod, the glory has departed, or the glory is gone. After that, Israel... The last remaining part of Israel, which was Judah, was destroyed by the Babylonians. And even though the Persian Empire let, let the Jewish people go home, the Jewish people never again were a self-governing people. They were first under the control of the Persians. They came on later, by the time of Jesus, were under the control of the Romans, who asserted rule with an iron rod. Now, Rome, because it was such a large empire, the Caesar could not rule all parts alone. And so he would set up, like puppet kings, enter King Herod, to rule parts of his nation, but only if he aligned with Roman rule. The job of the prefect, which would have been Pilate, was to assert Roman rule over the area, stop any kind of rebellion, punish the people who get out of line, and make sure that he maintains Roman loyalty. Often, this job of a prefect would have been given to a political ally or a friend, kind of like what we would maybe call nepotism today. But what happened during Jesus is the Jewish people had such hatred for the Romans that the Jewish people, they wanted their own king. Herod or Herod was self-proclaimed king of the Jews, but the people never claimed him king of the Jews. And so the people were waiting for their king. And they wanted their king to save them from this Roman rule. And so we have this picture of the king leaving, the, the, king, the glory of God leaving in Ezekiel. But there was a promise that one day through that east gate of Jerusalem, the glory would one day return, the king would one day return, and this is where we have Christ Jesus coming on a donkey. Christ Jesus rode into Jerusalem through that east gate, from the Mount of Olives directly into the city of Jerusalem, where then he goes into the temple to clear the money changers. It was through the very same gate that the glory of God left that this king of glory would return. But this week, we don't elevate Jesus as the king of glory. What we focus on this week is he becomes king of the curse. This is a very, very important notion for you and I to understand. Our king of glory becomes what we call king of the curse or king of the accursed. To be cursed or accursed means to be under divine judgment of God, or to be accosted by God, to be punished by God. Normally, when you have the coronation of the king, a king gets beautiful, a beautiful crown full of gold and jewels, very, very expensive. You can Google the crown jewels of England sometime, see what kind of crown a king should wear. For King Jesus, he wasn't crowned as this king of glory, His crown was made from thorns and thistles placed upon his head as an accursed king. You see, those thorns and thistles are a very important aspect because they were part of the curse. Remember, when God pronounced judgment on Adam in Genesis 3, beginning in verse 17, he said, And he said to Adam the man, Since you have listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle and scratch to make a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Then you will eat its grain. Through that you will eat its grain. By the sweat of your brow... You will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. From dust you were made and to dust you will return. Adam is cursed with hard labor, with thorns and thistles and with death. 
To crown Jesus with a crown of thorns is to say that Jesus becomes that king or that, that, that effector of the curse. Jesus is the one who accepts it all. You see, Jesus being king of kings means nothing if first he does not redeem his creation. And so therefore, he is crowned as king of this accursed creation. You realize because of sins, we are cursed. We are cursed by God to be punished, to die. As Paul says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But Paul tells us that Jesus became that curse for us. Paul tells us in Galatians 3, verse 13, that he redeemed us from the curse. It says, Christ rescued, Galatians 3, 13, rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law when he hung on the cross and took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoings. For it is written in scripture, cursed is everyone who hung on the tree. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he's promised to Abraham so that we who, be, who, who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. But don't miss that. He took upon our curse. Cursed is anyone who hung on a tree. Not only did he die a criminal's death, but he died a cursed death on the cross, becoming a curse of sin for us to free us from that curse. You see, the moment that Jesus was crowned as this king, he was no longer just the son of God, but an enemy of God, punished by God for our sins. To become our king, first Jesus would have to accept the burden of our sins, the weight of our sins, and therefore be punished by his very own father. And he became so sinful, he became the very essence of sin that he cries on the cross, why God have you abandoned me? And it is because God could no longer see Jesus, only a sinner getting what he deserves. And God cannot be around sin. And so for that moment, the Trinity, the, the oneness, the wholeness of God was torn asunder, laid in two because God could no longer be around his son. So this is our king. This is the king who, who died for us. This is the king who has come to us. And what we, what we see in Matthew 21 is we see the triumphal entry of this king. The coronation ceremony of this king. You see, this king... Jesus came to Jerusalem just as King Solomon did, if you were to read in 1 Kings. King Solomon, David gave him his donkey. This was his son. David was the father of Solomon. Gave him his donkey, had him ride to the pool of Shion, where he was anointed as king. And then he rode back into Jerusalem on a donkey using a similar path that Jesus took. And there was a great processional and a great celebration. You see, all the kings of Israel are anointed by the priests. That's what the name Messiah or Christ or Christos means. The anointed one of God. Remember when David wanted to kill Saul and David didn't kill Saul. David said, God forbid it for me to harm the Lord's anointed. Every king was anointed and seen as a foreshadow of the king or the Messiah. You can think of them as maybe a little M Messiah. They are the placeholder. What's interesting to note is Jesus, just like all the kings before, before he entered to Jerusalem, he was anointed as king. In John 11, it's recorded that before the triumphal entry, or I'm sorry, John 12, Beginning in verse 1, he was anointed. It says, six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, John 12, 1, the home of Lazarus, the man he'd raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Now, I imagine a lot of people wanted to talk to Jesus in that moment. But in the same notion, I imagine Lazarus was a pretty popular character. Have you ever eaten with anyone that was resurrected from the dead? I imagine we'd have a lot of questions. 
Did you see a light? What did it look like? What did it feel like? It says he was there with them. And then, verse 3, Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made with the essence of nard. And there she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would betray him, said this perfume was worth a year's wage. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And I love this little tagline. Not that he cared about the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So she pours out this perfume. Now, understand something here. To be worth a year's wages, you'd have to save up quite a while to get that because there's other expenses that accumulate throughout the year. It might have been worth a year's wages, but it might have taken 10 years to save up enough money to buy this 12-ounce jar. And if you have expensive perfume, you might only want to wear it on special occasions and only in that moment a little bit because you want it to last as long as possible. But here she is. She has this expensive jar, and she sees Jesus, and she pours it all out to him. You know, it's not like she says, okay, one drop for your right foot, one drop for your left foot. All the jar poured out to him. What's interesting to note is when the kings were anointed with oil, they also were anointed with perfume, the very same perfume, the essence of nard. This perfume would have smelled just like it smelled when it was poured out on Solomon's head, when it was poured out on David's head. And what's so interesting is there were studies done to say that this perfume was so powerful that it would have lasted several days. You know, they don't shower every day. They couldn't. And so this perfume would have lasted several days. And not only that, but nard had a way of absorbing into the skin that when you would exert yourself or when you would sweat after, you would smell that sweet perfume. And so what's so incredible is, yes, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he might not have looked like a king. He might not have come like an ordinary king, but boy, he smelled like a king. It is if the very senses of all the people are testifying that this one man is this king they have been waiting for, that this is the rightful king of the Jews. Where Herod said, I am your king of the Jews, all of the people knew that was not the case, but there was somebody else coming. And this was Christ Jesus. Matthew 21, verse 1, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethage on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Now that's an important prophecy, Zechariah 9.9. Because the people of Israel, they had an idea about what their Messiah would look like. And they wanted a king more like the Roman emperor, this great processional. You know, when a king comes into a city, there is a great processional. Normally, the king sends envoys on ahead. Normally, when the king comes, he wants to show his strength. So he brings a ton of gold with him, people carrying gold, people carrying food. It wasn't uncommon for a king to throw out gold along the road as he goes or give food to people as he goes. Because what better way to attract a crowd and build up your ego than have a whole people there who want money or food to show his benevolence? I mean, they would crown him. They would celebrate. There would be a great feast. Well, Jesus comes as a humble king. Even though he is the king of kings, even though he is the Lord of lords, even though he is deserving of it all, he comes in humility. But what you have to realize is we needed a humble king because the kings of this earth would not have laid down their throne for us what king what ruler do you know would give up power and sacrifice himself for you and i you see we needed a humble king because it was only that humble king that would step down from his throne give up his glory for you and i 
you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians 2. Keep your finger in Matthew 21, but Philippians 2, verse 5. Uh, this is what the big seminary word is called, kenosis. Kenosis means to give up divine privilege. I think we've talked about that before. K-E-N-O-S-I-S, kenosis. Philippians 2, verse 5, we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, or the mind of Christ. And then Paul explains that to us. Though he was God, and you can underline that, circle that, whatever you need to do to remind yourself, he was and is God. Though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He was equal with God the Father. He is the Almighty. He is the Lord himself. He is the very essence of God. Though he did not think of it as something to cling to, instead, it says he set aside his divine privilege. And that's what kenosis means, to give up or set aside divine privilege. He emptied himself, other translations say, and took on the humble position of the slave, was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. He humbled himself. I mean, he was the king of everything. He was the creator of everything. And he set all that aside to come to be one of us, not only to be one of us, to be marked and scorned and abused by us, killed by us, die a criminal's death, not only a criminal's death, but a cursed death on the cross for you and I. You know, there's a part in John, in John 12, where Jesus is talking about his death. And he's having a conflict because he's, he's a man. Yes, he's God, but he's a man. And he's worried about going through with this. And in John 12, Jesus is asking, he's praying to God, and he says, what should I pray for, Lord? Should I pray that you take away this hardship from me? Should I pray that you take away this suffering from me? And that seems like a reasonable prayer. If you and I go through issues, if you and I have problems, what are the first thing we do? Lord, take this from me. But Jesus says, no, I cannot pray that. So instead, I pray you be glorified. And that's a powerful prayer. Jesus says, I don't care about me. I don't care what I'm going to have to suffer. I don't care what I'm going to have to go through. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what it hurts me. I don't care what I have to give up or what I have to put up with. My prayer and my priority is you be glorified, oh God. You be glorified. And Paul says we need to have that same attitude, the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ that puts the glory of God above all else. To say, oh Lord, I don't care what I have to do. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care if I have to be made fun of. I don't care if I have to be made a fool in front of men. I don't care what it costs. I want you to be glorified. I want you to be glorified in my life. Because the Bible tells us that if we seek the glory of God, not the glory of man... Jesus gave up his glory, but in verse 9 of Philippians 2, it says, Therefore God elevated him into the place of highest honor, the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those who elevate themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted, the Bible says. And Jesus is proof of this. Jesus did not seek the praise of man. In fact, Jesus chose to be scorned and rejected by man. To be this accursed king so that God could raise him as this king of glory. But that's the problem. Do we want the glory of God more than the glory of man? Do you realize, I, I love John. John 12 reveals the problem of the Pharisees. John 12, beginning in verse 41, talking about a prophet, Isaiah. It says, Isaiah was, was referring to Jesus when he said this because, the future he, because he saw the future. He spoke of the Messiah's glory. And this is, where it's, this is where Isaiah says their eyes are blind, their ears are deaf, they can't hear, they can't understand. And in verse 42, this is very important, many people did believe him, however. Many people did know he was Jesus, knew he was God, including some of the Jewish leaders. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the very people who wanted to put him to death, they knew exactly who he was. But 
They wouldn't admit it for fear the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. Verse 43, they loved human praise more than the praise of God. That was the issue. It wasn't that he was a revolutionary. It wasn't that he was a rebel. It wasn't that they thought he was blaspheming God. They knew exactly who he was, but they wanted the praise of man more than the praise of God. They wanted to be elevated. They didn't want anything to do with this King Jesus because it would take away their position and their authority. Do you realize when they heard Lazarus raised from the dead, in John 12, it says they planned to kill Lazarus. Why? What was Lazarus' crime? It says because of the account of Lazarus, many people were turning to follow Jesus. Now, they can say what they want. They can say Jesus is a revolutionary. Jesus deserves to die. All Lazarus did was come back from the grave but they wanted to kill him because people were following Jesus because of that. They didn't want this king of glory. They wanted this king of glory dead. But here he is coming into Jerusalem in this great processional. He says in verse 6 of Matthew 21 back there, the two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and they threw the garments over the colt and he sat on it. Now, one thing I don't think we give enough credit for is the, the faith of the man who gave up the donkeys. I mean, in, other, in the other gospel accounts, it records the man did stop them, and they said just what Jesus said, the Lord needs them, and he gave them up. I mean, that's a lot of faith. You have to understand something. A donkey would be the equivalent to a car today. Not even a car. It would be like your work vehicle today. You need a big truck for something? What if somebody came along was messing with your truck and said, and you said, what are you doing? Oh, the Lord needs them. How many of you would turn over your keys and the title, here it goes, you got a full tank of gas, go ahead and use it. The man didn't ask any more questions than that. The Lord needs them, he said, take them, take them both. And so Jesus came riding in on a donkey. And, and you got to understand something, this would have been humbling. I mean, when you, ma- when you imagine Prince Charming or, your, or this, this wonderful king, the least you imagine him is on a white steed, this beautiful stallion. You see a donkey, there's nothing majestic about a donkey. You've ever heard what the sound they make? You think something's dying. And yet here Jesus comes humbly, riding on this donkey. And the people know exactly what this is. The people know that he's coming to be their king. Most of the crowd, in verse 8, spread their garments on the road ahead of him. Others cut palm branches down and spread them on the road. Jesus was at the center of the processional, and all the people were shouting, Hosanna for the son of David. Blessings in the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest. The entire center of the city was, was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked, as the crowd replied, It is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Hosanna means save now. Save us, Lord. Save us from the Romans. Of course, Jesus came first to save them from their sins. So here he is, this humble king coming. And and I love this idea. In fact, I heard a pastor preach a sermon on this before. Even before seeing Jesus directly, that perfume would have gone before him. And and as he's coming, people, their senses start to tell him there's this king There's this king. And with this perfume lasting several days, the the pastor went on to say, when Judas came to betray him and Judas gave him a kiss, Judas would have got a whiff of that. This king. When the religious leaders are questioning him, are you the king of the Jews? Their very noses are saying, he is the king of the Jews. But of course, when Jesus answered them, it says in, verse, in Matthew 26, verse 67, they began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fist, and they slapped him, jeering, prophesy to us, you Messiah, who hit you that time? But while they got close enough to slap him again, their very senses would have told him this was the Messiah, this was the anointed one of God. When he was stood before Pilate and Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you have said it, but my kingdom is not of this world. He would have smelled as a king would have smelled. And finally, you have his coronation ceremony. At a coronation ceremony, the king has the vestiges vestiges put on him. The robe, the crown, the glory, the honor. He holds a scepter in his hand. Well, our king of glory got just that. Matthew 27, verse 27. 
Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, the garments of a king. Then they wove thorn branches into a crown and placed it on his head. They placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter, doing everything you should do for a king, only they did it mockingly. And then they knelt down before him in mockery, taunting, Hail, the king of the Jews. They spit on him. They grabbed the stick and struck him in the head with it. And it says, When they finally grew tired of mocking him, not because they thought he had enough, not because they were being merciful. They did it so much that they were bored. So when they finally grew tired, then they took off the robes, put on his clothes, and led him away to be crucified. And when he was hung on that cross, when he, when he had his nails put in his hands, they would have been smelling that sweet perfume. People passing by with a sign above his head in the three languages, reading the king of the Jews. Of course, the religious leaders said, change it. Put on instead, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate, probably the only brave thing Pilate ever did was to say, I've said what I've said, and everyone reads the king of the Jews. That's why you see on the cross, you see this little symbol, the, the, what we, it's pronounced inri. It means, it means Jesus Christ, king of the Jews. People mocking him, saying he saved others, but he could not save himself. You realize that's true. He could not save himself and save others. And so he chose to save us. Finally, he died a criminal's death on the cross, but his death moved the guard so much that when he died, it says in verse Matthew 27, verse 54, the Roman officers and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man was truly the son of God. Of course, that's not where the story ends. Three days later, it says on Sunday morning, Matthew 28, early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake for the angel of, an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone aside and sat on it. His face shone like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman. Do not be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Just as he said would happen, come and see where his body was lying, and now go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. You see, he died as a king, as the king of the curse, but he arose as the king of glory, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And now the truth of the scripture and what we'll talk about next week is that king will one day return. That king of glory will one day enter into his throne, into his kingdom. You and I have been bought and purchased by the blood of the lamb. And when he returns, he'll set up his throne. And you want to talk about a good leader? I don't care what you think is going to happen in this next election, if you think anyone's going to save us, you're dreaming. But when Christ Jesus comes, when he sets up his kingdom, then things will be made right. Then things will be the way they ought to be. We have no idea what perfection looks like, but Christ Jesus will come and set up that perfection. No more death, no more dying, no more fear, no more diseases, no more sickness. A fair and a just ruler. And when we talk about next week, we'll talk about the two different reactions to his coming. It says, for those who love him, it's our blessed hope. But for those who do not love him, it's a fear and a dread, a terror and a dread for them. But until he comes, we have one response. We have to be those who witness to him. In fact, talking about this sweet-smelling perfume, Paul has a word to say about this in 2 Corinthians 2. And I'll end with this in verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, but thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. We have been brought out. We were enemies of God at one point, but the king of glory saved us, and now we're part of that procession, this great procession of the coming king. You realize when he returns, he returns with all the saints with him. 
And it says, now he uses us to spread knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Just as that anointing told everyone that Christ is king, it is now us to spread that knowledge to say he is king. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance raising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. They want nothing to do with it. They, it stinks to them. The glory of God means nothing to them. They are infuriated by it. This is why they hate us so much, because it's a reminder to them that there is punishment, that there is sin. And, it's, and when they smell that sweet perfume of Christ, all they can see is how bad they stink. But they don't want to give any of that up. But it says, for those who are being saved, to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. Then I love how Paul ends this, this one teaching. He said, and who is adequate for such a task as this? Who among us is adequate? I hope you never lose what you've been called to do. The Almighty has tasked us with being his witnesses. I don't know why. I tell you, if I was God, I'm sure I could find better servants in the angels. The angels don't rebel against him. But he wanted us. The Almighty tasked us with being his witnesses. He called you out of your broken life and said, now you're part of my life. You'll be my witnesses. I mean, that ought to knock you off your feet to know the ever-living God wants you to be a part of his plan. His presence in Eurexville is here with us. He wants us to be that sweet perfume that spreads to tell others about him. He wants us, he tasked us, and he did it and trusted us so much that he left. He left, went up to God, and said, I'm leaving you here to be my witnesses. I'm leaving you here to testify about me. Of course, who's adequate for this? None of us. That's why Jesus told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. And Acts 1.8, it says, that when the Holy Spirit comes, we will receive power and we will be his witnesses. Our lives are a sweet perfume that needs to call others to Christ. That Christ-like fragrance. If we are to live for the king, then we can no longer live the cursed, sinful life that we were known for before. We must live anew in Christ Jesus. Bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, You've given up everything for us. Lord God, you have given us everything. You've sent your only son to be a cursed king for us, to die for us that we might live again, to die for us that we might be restored, oh Lord God. Oh Lord God, you gave him to us, and Jesus, you set aside that divine privilege to die a criminal's death for us. But now you are risen as the king of glory. And it is to the glory of God that we are here, that we are called here. And Lord, may we tirelessly work for this glory of God. May we seek after it. May we desire it above all else. And let us be that sweet fragrance that you call us to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. Please stand as you are able as we sing our closing song. If you